This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. I'm going to just begin by reading some poems and saying a little bit about the, the, the things that influenced me when, when I was a, a younger poet in Ireland. And I think the, the thing that is almost hard to convey uh, is if you live in a small, intense country, which I certainly did uh, at that time when I was beginning to write, it, it was a moment in Ireland when the history was a powerful, intense history. It took me a long time to see that there was a very big difference in Ireland between the past and history. That history was an official version and a version of heroes, but that the past was a place of really shadows and whispers and failures and defeats. As time gone, went on, that rift seemed to me bigger and bigger. And I wrote this poem, I suppose, at the end of that sense of things in myself. It's a poem called Quarantine. It comes from a, a sentence in a book called Mishkel Fein, which was published at the start of the 20th century, uh, a man remembering a very small village, Carrick Styra in West Cork, where the famine hit hard. Two young people left their cabin and uh, walked back in, in the cold uh, from the workhouse, and they uh, went to that cabin and were found dead in the morning, but he had tried to warm her feet as she died. And they go into those sentences for about four clauses, and they vanish. This is called quarantine. In the worst hour of the worst season of the worst year of a whole people, a man set out from the workhouse with his wife. He was walking, they were both walking north. She was sick with famine fever and could not keep up. He lifted her and put her on his back. He walked like that, west and west and north, until at nightfall, under freezing stars, they arrived. In the morning, they were both found dead, of cold, of hunger, of the toxins of a whole history. But her feet were held against his breastbone, the last heat of his flesh was his last gift to her. Let no love poem ever come to this threshold. There is no place here for the inexact praise of the easy graces and sensuality of the body. There is only time for this merciless inventory. Their death together in the winter of 1847, also what they suffered, how they lived, and what there is between a man and woman, and in which darkness it can best be proved. The, the other poem that, that really, I suppose, addressed this for me, I mean, this was part of a conversation inside myself that happened in trying to, you know, work out what it means to be a poet from a small country, what it means to be a poet from a powerful history, how we give a name to something or suddenly find that something is unnamed. This is a poem called That the Science of Cartography is Limited. And it, it comes from, uh, you know, my, my husband comes from uh, the, the, the middle of the country, from County Meath. Meath and Mayo were both two counties in which you find something in Ireland called famine roads. And these are the, 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 the roads which, during the terrible famine of 1847, the British sent over these committees to decide what relief to give to the poor and starving Irish. And they would only give them food in return for work. And of course, they had no strength to work. And sometimes when you look down in the woods there, you see these roads give out into nothing, where the people died building them. But they don't show up on a map, and that's what this poem is. That the science of cartography is limited, and not simply, by the fact that this shading of forest cannot show the fragrance of balsam, the gloom of cypresses, is what I wish to prove. When you and I were first in love, we drove to the borders of Connacht and entered a wood there. Look down, you said. This was once a famine road. 
I looked down at ivy and the scotch grass rough cast stone had disappeared into, as you told me in the second winter of their ordeal, in 1847 when the crop had failed twice. Relief committees gave the starving Irish such roads to build. Where they died, there the road ended and ends still. And when I take down the map of this island, it is never so. I can say here is the masterful, the apt rendering of the spherical as flat, nor an ingenious design which persuades a curve into a plane. But to tell myself again that the line which says woodland and cries hunger and gives out among sweet pine and cypress and finds no horizon will not be there. Now, I'm lucky enough to, to teach at, at Stanford University, uh, which Bob has is such a distinguished uh, graduate as well as from here. But, uh, you know, I, I would put it as uh, a a co-favorite job. It is a co-favorite, if you can have that. And the reason I say that is because uh, another favorite job at the time that I got it was a very odd job that I got in Dublin in 1994. There is a big maternity hospital right in the middle of the city, and it's called H Hollis Street Hospital. And it's a, um, a, just a large, ugly, red brick building where, you know, most of the city of Dublin has been born. And actually, when you look closely at it, it has another history. It is the hospital from which James Joyce wrote the Oxen of the Sun chapter. But you would have to go to a lot of rooms in that hospital to find a very small plaque to James Joyce. They don't like the chapter at all. So um, uh, in 1994, uh, they asked me to be their poet in residence because it was the centenary. And you know, uh, people in Dublin were interested in it. And they used to say to me, you know, what are you doing at the National Maternity Hospital? You know, what do you, I mean, what do you do there? Do you just go into the, the mothers and the babies? And I, I never went near the, the new mothers and the new babies because my children were born in that hospital. And just like the last thing I would have liked to see when they were born was the poet in residence. So, <laughs> um, so this is a poem called The Pomegranate. It is the poem I wrote in that year. It was for my first daughter, registered the surprise. I'm sure many in the room have felt it, having a child who turned into a teenager. And uh, it also was to, you know, built on the great myth uh, of Ceres, whose child goes to the underworld, tries to get her back, gets her back for half the year, which is the myth of the seasons. Uh, but the child could have come back entirely if they hadn't eaten anything but they eat a pomegranate. The pomegranate. The only legend I have ever loved is the daughter, is the story of a daughter lost in hell and found and rescued there. Love and blackmail are the gist of it, Ceres and Persephone, the names. And the best thing about the legend is I can enter it anywhere and have. As a child in exile in a city of fogs and strange consonants, I read it first. And at first, I was an exiled child in the crackling dusk of the underworld. The stars blighted. Later, I walked out in a summer twilight, searching for my daughter at bedtime. When she came running, I was ready to make any bargain to keep her. I carried her back past white beams and wasps and honey-scented buddleias. But I was Ceres then. And I knew winter was in store, for every leaf on every tree on that road was inescapable for each one we passed and for me. It is winter and the stars are hidden. I climb the stairs and stand where I can see my child asleep beside her teen magazines, her can of Coke, her plate of uncut fruit, the pomegranate. How did I forget it? She could have come home and been safe and ended the story and all our heartbroken searching. But she reached out a hand and plucked a pomegranate. She put out her hand and pulled down the French sound for apple and the noise of stone and the proof that even in the place of death at the heart of legend, in the midst of rocks full of unshed tears, ready to be diamonds by the time the story was told, a child can be hungry. I could warn her there is still a chance. The rain is cold, 
The road is flint colored. The suburb has cars and cable television. The veiled stars are above ground. It is another world. But what else can a mother give her daughter but such beautiful rifts in time? If I defer the grief, I will diminish the gift. The legend will be hers as well as mine. She will enter it as I have. She will wake up. She will hold the papery flushed skin in her hand and to her lips, and I will say nothing. This is a, a new poem, and in, in some ways it tries to address something which I think a, a lot of uh, writers are going to try to um, grapple with, you know, the extraordinary changes that have come to Ireland in the last 20 years. You know, we, we moved 30 years ago to a small, you know, suburb just about three and a half miles outside the center. You know, you, you can see inscribed in the neighborhoods of Dublin the coherence and the incoherence that has come there, the troubles that have come, the so-called economic boom which was so-called Celtic tiger, which turned out not to be uh, an animal of that species at all, and uh, the, the extraordinary collapse. And the, the many things, and you know, this is called rereading Oliver Goldsmith's Deserted Village in the New Ireland. You know, that, that strange poem that Oliver Goldsmith wrote, you know, Sweet Auburn, loveliest village of the plain partly built on the Irish memory of Lissoy, where he came from, partly built on the English villages. That sense of what do we do when we name a country? I look at our small neighborhood, and I look at things, and I wonder, what are we destroying by not giving them the name? Here's the poem. Well, not for years, at least not then and then. I never looked at it and never took it down. The place was changing, that much was plain. Land was sold, the little river was paved over with stone. Lilac went wild, our neighbors opposite put out the for sale sign. And all the while I let Goldsmith's old lament remain where it was. High on my shelves, stacked there at the back, dust collecting on its out of date, other century superannuated pain. A spring morning, the husbands and wives in the walled graveyard who brought peace to one another's bodies are not separated. A first gleam of sunshine in Mulvey's builder's yard, but wait, Mulvey's hardware closed down years ago and the cemetery can't be seen from the road. Here in the village of Dundrum, the manor laundry was once the corn mill. The laundry was shut and became a bowling alley. The main street held the petty sessions and dispensary. Now visitors come from the new town center, their arms cradling names, strings, bags. Someone else is living out their first springtime under these mountains. Someone else feels the sudden ease that comes when the wind veers. Would anything come back to us if we gave it a different name? Sweet Auburn, loveliest village of the plain. I take down the book. Centuries and years fall softly from the page. Sycamores, monasteries, a schoolhouse, and river-loving trees, their leaves casting iron-colored shadows, are falling and falling as the small town of Lissoy sinks deeper into sweet Augustan double talk and disappears. I wanted to read a poem which uh, recognizes this, of course, wonderful library. But in fact, you know, it is um, a straightforward uh, poem uh, of, of marriage. And I just find it here and hope that it, it strikes a, an echo with someone. Um, this is uh, a poem that is called Thank It Be Fortune. It comes from Thomas Wyatt's wonderful poem, you know, Thank It Be Fortune. It hath been otherwise different. In fact, Kevin and I married 40 years ago, and we had the a kind of agreement which many married couples have. Kevin is a huge book collector. And, you know, those books had crept into a lot of rooms. And we had, I thought, all kinds of social and political treaties that they would not creep into other rooms, but they, they crept. 
And one day I found that they had just gone right to the edge of the bedroom and they were, you know, neatly now stacked over the bed. And one day, you know, when I looked up, I saw that over the bed as it happened were all these stories of murders <laughs> and love affairs. And, you know, so this is thank it be fortune. Did we live a double life? I would have said we never envied the epic glory of the star-crossed. I would have said we learned by heart the code marriage makes of passion, duty, dailiness, routine. But after dark, when we went to bed, under the bitter fire of constellations, orderly, uninterested, and cold, at least in our case, in the bookshelves just above our heads, all through the hours of darkness, men and women wept, cursed, kept, and broke faith, and killed themselves for love. Then it was dawn again. Restored to ourselves, we woke early and lay together, listening to our child crying as if to birdsong, with ice on the windowsills and the grass eking out the last crooked hour of starlight. Uh, the, the poem I want to read now, I'm afraid, it is a much darker poem, which is the title poem of Domestic Violence. In the, um, the conversations which have existed in Ireland since the peace process, I think many, many people uh, all over that island have to search their minds and their memories and their hearts to know where that started. And the truth is, as we all know anyway, it starts where we begin. And this poem just looks back uh, at the, that time, at the extraordinary um, darkness of the sight of a beautiful island falling apart, and of citizens killing each other, and it's called domestic violence. It was winter, lunar, wet. At dusk, pewter seedlings became moonlight orphans. Pleased to meet you, meet to please you, said the butcher's sign in the window in the village. Everything changed the year that we got married, and after that we moved out to the suburbs. How young we were, how ignorant, how ready to think the only history was our own. And there was a couple who quarreled into the night their voices high and sharp. Nothing is ever entirely right in the lives of those who love each other. And in that season, suddenly, our island broke out its old sores for all to see. We saw them too. We stood there wondering how the salt horizons and the Dublin hills, the rivers, table mountains, Viking marshes we thought we knew, had been made to shiver into our ancient 12 by 15 television, which gave them back as gray and grayer tears and killings, 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 then moonlight-colored funerals. Nothing we said, not then, not later, fathomed what it is is wrong in the lives of those who hate each other. And if the provenance of memory is only that, remember not a tone. And if I can be safe in the weak spring light in that kitchen, then why is there another kitchen, spring light always darkening in it, and a woman whispering to a man over and over, what else could we have done? We failed our moment, or our moment failed us. The times were grand in size, and we were small. Why do I write that when I don't believe it? We lived our lives, were happy, stayed as one. Children were born and raised here and are gone, including ours. As for that couple, did we ever find out who they were, and did we want to? I think we know, I think we always knew. You know, I grew up in a, um, a, a city where things came uh, and disappeared quickly. Um, and, you know, one of my mother was, in every sense, really a great hero of mine. Uh, she had sort of had a very hard start in the world. Um, she was orphaned, and um, she loved household implements, and that would be the word for it. She, she loved the, the domestic things of a kitchen. She was a great cook. And you know, one day when I looked around, they were just all gone. You know, they disappeared somewhere between, you know, 
our last European treaty and our next one, suddenly you couldn't find anything, things, electrical objects were coming in from everywhere. And, you know, I thought back to that kitchen and I thought back to her presence in it. This poem is called An Elegy for My Mother in which she scarcely appears. It's also an elegy for the, that ecosystem that went. I knew we had to grieve for the animals a long time ago, weep for them, pity them. I knew it was our strange human duty to write their elegies after we arranged their demise. I was young then and able for the paradox. I am older now and ready with the question, what happened to them all? I mean to those old dumb implements which have no eyes to plead with us like theirs, no claim to make on us like theirs. I mean, there was a singing kettle. I want to know why no one tagged its neck or ringed the tin base of its extinct design or crouched to hear its rising shriek in winter or wrote it down with the birds in their blue sleeves of air torn away with the trees that sheltered them. And there were brass fire dogs which lay out all evening on the grate and in the heat thrown at them by the last of the peat fire. But no one noted down their history or put them in the old packs under slate blue moonlight. There was a wooden clothes horse, absolutely steady, without sinews, with no mane and no meadows to canter in, carrying instead of landlords or Irish monks, rinsed tea cloths. But still, I would have thought, worth adding to the catalog of what we need, what we always need, as is my mother, on this doubling evening of fog crystals and frost, as she reaches out to test one corner of a cloth for dryness as the pre-war Irish twilight closes in and down on the room and the curtains are drawn. And here am I, not even born and already a conservationist, with nothing to assist me but the last and most fabulous of beasts, language, language, which knows, as I do, that it's too late to record the loss of these things, but does so anyway and anxiously in case it shares their fate. I want to, to finish with a poem that I have a little bit of a a description for, and um, it, it's a poem that came from, from an earlier part of my life when I really was struggling to think, you know, of, of what it meant to be a poet. It was towards the sort of end of the 20th century, not quite there. And I, I you know, felt as so many poets felt, you know, who, who are we speaking to? How do we keep that lyric intensity how you know what have we lost and i happen to be reading a, a wonderful book it's called the decline of the middle ages it's um uh by heitzinger it's okay as long as it's, it's mine <laughs> it's okay and um and you know uh i came in this book on this kind of wonderful uh, little tag it said, Isabella of Bavaria married Charles VI of France in 1385. In later years, his madness took the form of believing he was made from glass. Now, I thought that would make considerable domestic difficulties, you know, so. Uh, but, you know, in some way, that glass king stayed with me, stayed with me as an emblem you know, of what we don't want to be, what we, that is what we don't want. I mean, you know, to lose that touchable humanity as poets. This is the Glass King. When he is ready, he is raised and carried among his vaporish plants. The palms and ferns flex, they almost bend. You'd almost think they were going to kiss him. And so they might, but she will not, his wife. Nope, she can't kiss his lips in case he splinters into a million Bourbons, mad pieces. What can she do with him? 
her daft prince. His nightmares are the Regency of France. Yep, she's been through it all. His Bavaroise, blub-hipped and docile, urgent to be needed, from churching to milk fever, from tongue-tied princess to the queen of a mulish king, and now this. They were each other's fantasy in youth, no splintering at all about that mouth when they were flesh and muscle, woman and man, fire and kindling. See that silk divan? Enough said. Now the times themselves are his asylum. These are the Middle Ages sweet and savage era of the saving grace. Indulgences are to a penny. Under the stonesmith's hand, stone turns into lace. I need his hand now. Outside my window, October soaks the stone. You can hear it. You'd almost think the brick was drinking it. The rowan drips, and history waits and let it wait. I want no elsewheres. The clover-smelling stove-warm air of autumn catches cold. The year turns, the leaves fall, the poem hesitates. If we could see ourselves, not as we do, in mirrors, self-deceptions, self-regardings, but as we ought to be, and as we have been, poets, lute stringers, makers and abettors of our necessary art, soothsayers of the ailment and disease of our time, sweet singers, truth tellers, intercessors for self-knowledge. What would we think of these fantasy half-hearted penitents we have become at the sickbed of the century, hand-wringing elegists with an ill-concealed greed for the inheritance? My prince demented in a crystal past, a lost France, I elect you emblem and ancestor of our lyric. It fits you like a glove, doesn't it? The part untouchable, outlandish, esoteric, inarticulous, and out of reach of human love. Studied every day by your wife, an ordinary, honest woman out of place in all this, wanting nothing more than the man she married, all her sorrows in her stolid face. Thank you very much. Thank you.